without ever violating the laws of physics in any way whatsoever, Darwinian natural selection has put together on this planet, and I would conjecture on rather a lot of other planets as well, something utterly extraordinary. The world of complexity, which is unknown to physicists, the world of complexity, which is the world of biology, and on this planet at least has produced the human brain, which is capable of understanding the process that gave rise to it, capable of making a model of the universe in which we stand. I have coined the phrase, the genetic book of the dead, to describe the gene pool of a species, in the sense that the chisels of the sculptor, which is natural selection, work away at carving the shape of the gene pool of the ancestors of every animal plant alive, carving it into the shape required for the animals concerned to survive in their particular environment. And that, what that means is that the gene pool of, say, a camel is a kind of description of ancestral deserts. The gene pool of an antelope is a description of the savanna of the ancestors. It's a description of the lions or leopards that the ancestors escaped from. And reciprocally, the gene pool of a, of, of a, of a lion is a, uh, a coded description of the prey that the ancestral lions caught. So the gene pool of every species is a unique informational description of the ancestral worlds in which they survived. And mostly all the genes in the gene pool share the same ancestral history. They all share the same, we could almost call it, experience of the past, ancestral experience. But wouldn't it be interesting to find a place where some of the genes in the gene pool have had a different ancestral experience from others. This would be a, a critical, almost an experimental test. And I want to tell you a story about one such example. Cuckoos. The European cuckoo uh, parasitizes quite a large number of different species. You know they're brood parasites. You know that the female does not lay an egg in her own nest. She goes and finds a nest of a, of a host species. It might be a hedge sparrow, it might be a meadow pipit, it might be a reed warbler, it might be a robin, and deposits an egg in the nest, having removed one egg from the host nest. The young cuckoo hatches out first, before its foster siblings, and then the first thing it does is to toss out the eggs of the other, um, of, the, of the foster species. The, the young cuckoo, the first thing it does, it, it gets the egg into, into a sort of hollow in its back, and it shuffles its way backwards over the ledge, edge of the nest, tosses the e egg out. Obviously, it has no idea why it does it. It's got no idea of anything very much. This is built into the, ner the nervous system. And the cuckoo has many, many other fascinating adaptations to its brood parasitic way of life. Now, here's the point. The same species, Cuculus canorus, the same species parasitizes a large number of different host species. And when it lays an egg in each of the nest, each host species, the eggs mimic those of the host species. So uh, when a female cuckoo lays an egg in a reed warbler nest, the egg that it lays looks like reed warbler eggs. When it lays it in meadow pipit, uh, nests, the egg is dark, almost black, it looks like a meadow pipit egg, and so on. How can this happen? How can, the, how can the female cuckoo possibly produce the right kind of egg, given that it's got the same genes as all the other uh, cuckoos in the species, all one species? It's a bit of a mystery, and the answer is almost certainly known and it comes back to my point about different parts of the gene pool having different experience. 
Each female cuckoo learns the nature of the nest in which she herself was brought up. So there are females who are brought up in robin nests, and they return when they're adults to robin nests and lay eggs in robin nests. A female that was brought up in a reed warbler nest, when she grows up, she will return to reed warbler nests. Well, that's all very well, but they're still the same species. Now, here's the thing. As you know, in mammals, sex determination is done by an XXXY system, such that males have uh, different sex chromosomes. One is called Y, one is called X. Females have the same X and X. And if you work it out, when you cross an XX and an XY, 50% of the offspring will be XY. Uh, male, 50% will be XX female. So a Y chromosome in, in, a, in a mammal like, like us has only had experience of male bodies. Back through history, X chromosomes have had, uh, what is it, two-thirds of their time in, in female bodies and one-third in... Have I got that right? I can't be bothered to work it out. Um, <laughs> but the point is that in birds... The point is that in birds, it's the other way round. In birds, it's the female sex, which is XY, and the male sex, which is XX. So there is one part of the genome of a female cuckoo which has only ever had experience of female bodies, and a robin cuckoo female, her Y chromosome can look back on a long history of nothing but robin nests. Well, not quite nothing but, but at least for a long way, nothing but robin nests. A reed warbler female has got a Y chromosome that can look back on a long history of reed warbler nests. All the other genes in the genome can look back on a mixed history of all the different species that are parasitized. But the, the Y chromosome has unique experience. And so the whole thing is explained on the hypothesis that egg coloration is carried on the Y chromosome. And that enables uh, females to be specialists in one particular kind of, of host. They learn which kind of host they were brought up in themselves. And so this learning process sees to it that uh, the Y chromosome has this unique experience. Now, every now and again, a female cuckoo will, of course, make a mistake. They, they're, not, they're not perfect. Nothing's perfect. So a, a reed warbler cuckoo, for example, may by, by mistake lay an egg in a robin nest. And of course, her egg will then be very conspicuous. It won't look right. And the chances are that it'll be killed. Uh, it'll be thrown out by the foster parent. But that's how these new gentes, as they're called, female races, these new gentes um, come into being by females making a mistake. Now, if you look at the perfection of the egg mimicry in the different gentes, the different races of females, only females have races. Um, the males are all the same race, if you see what I mean. Um, robin cuckoos are exceedingly poor mimics of robin eggs. Meadow pipit cuckoos are exceedingly good mimics of meadow pipit eggs. And the hypothesis of Nick Davies, who's the main person who worked on this, is that cuckoos and their hosts are engaged in what's been called an evolutionary arms race. Arms races occur between predators and prey, parasites and hosts. And the idea is that robin cuckoos have only recently entered upon their arms race with robins. And therefore, neither the cuckoos have had time to develop perfection of egg mimicry, nor have the robins had time to develop perfection of discriminating the eggs. And that's why the egg mimicry is poor, and yet it still works. Whereas meadow pipits have been engaged in, an, in a much longer arms race against uh, meadow pipit cuckoos, and that's why both of them have reached perfection, have reached a much higher level of perfection on the cuckoo side, the egg mimicry, and on the uh, meadow pipit side, the discrimination. Isn't nature wonderful?
fantastic story.